Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and the topic for today is cardiovascular disease. I have two topics I'm going to cover under that uh, general heading. Um, let's start with hypertension is a major risk factor for a lot of conditions including stroke so it's important to measure blood pressure accurately since either underestimating or overestimating uh, blood pressure by just five points would mean misdiagnosis in as many as 50 million American adults. 50 million. Misdiagnosis, of course, leads to undertreatment, overtreatment, negatively affects health, and really spikes up costs. Well, the problem with accurate measurement is, first of all, most people don't know what that means. And the second thing, it takes training and time, and most doctor's offices are not set up to do it properly. So I'm going to tell you some of the factors that influence blood pressure that you might not be aware of and I think are important to be aware of so that you really know if you have hypertension or not. So the first, and I'll give you a little bit of an idea of what the variation can be. Uh, reading charts and tables in this setting is not so good, but I'll do a couple of them just to let you know. So uh, believe it or not, talking while you're having your blood pressure taken or active listening, like trying to concentrate on something, um, can have an effect of 10 points one way or another for both systolic and diastolic pressure. So think about the last time you had your blood pressure taken. Probably you were chatting away with the person doing it, needing to use the bathroom, 15 point difference systolic, 10 point difference diastolic. Um, a cuff over the clothing instead of on the bare arm can be up to 50 point difference on systolic pressure. I know, it's really just amazing. Um, and then some others, smoking within 30 minutes of the test, um, sitting with your back unsupported can be a 10 point swing. If your arm is unsupported while you're sitting or standing, it can cause a great deal of variation. So based on this, I actually found research articles where recommendations are made to how blood pressure should be married, married, measured in the doctor's office. And uh, when I read you this list, you're going to understand why this doesn't happen in the doctor's office because no doctor's office is set up for this. So the first thing is this patient should not be stressed when arriving at the doctor's office or clinic. And of course, that's a little bit up to us. But the second thing is I don't remember ever being asked before having my blood pressure taken. So are you under any stress right now? Because we've had a couple things happen around here in the last couple of weeks. If you'd taken my blood pressure, you probably would have taken me to the ER, right? So, so that's the first thing. The patient should use the restroom if necessary. No alcohol, food, cigarettes, caffeine, or exercise during the th 30 minutes prior to getting your blood pressure tested. The patient should wear loose clothing, sit in a quiet room without talking to anyone for three to five minutes uh, before measurement is taken. Both feet should be flat on the floor. Three readings should be done and an average of the three should be recorded. So how many doctor's appointments have you had in the last um, 25 years <laughs> where it was even possible for this to happen. And, and really, it's not the fault of the doctor's office that they're busy and they're overscheduled and all that sort of thing. So um, as a result, more and more people are recommending home uh, blood pressure monitoring because in addition to all this stuff, a lot of patients suffer from white coat syndrome and have artificially high readings in doctor's offices. It's been shown to be more accurate if you do home measurement and a better predictor of cardiovascular risk, morbidity, and mortality than the tests in the doctor's office. In addition to being a better diagnostic tool, home monitoring is better for managing hypertension. It's been shown to result in greater reductions in blood pressure for people who are taught to do it on a regular basis, and a better likelihood of reaching goal blood pressure. So the way that it should be done is people should take their readings several times over the course of a day, at the same time every day, and record them. And then the readings are averaged over a two to four week period, and one or two outliers can be usually ignored. More careful measurement of blood pressure, including home monitoring, results in a lot of benefits. Fewer people require medication. When medication is actually warranted, usually less is needed. The patients are safer when they make diet and lifestyle change because when they're measuring their blood pressure regularly, they can see their blood pressure dropping and call their doctor immediately and say, look, I've changed my diet, I'm losing weight. Um, I think we probably should do something about medication dosage before I end up comatose on the bathroom floor. Um, and generally, more people withdraw from more drugs when they do home blood pressure monitoring. And I'll tell you how this has worked in my own family. Um, some of you know, I've talked about my dad. He's 88 and he's drug free right now. Uh, we worked very hard to get him in that situation. And he, one of the drugs he was taking was a blood pressure medication. And the first thing is my father clearly has white coat syndrome. He's comatose at home and he has hypertension in the doctor's office. So that's the first thing. 
So we bought a blood pressure cuff and taught him how to measure his blood pressure at home and bought him a journal and we marked in it like right down all the times, you know, specific times of the day. And when my sister and I started looking at his blood pressure journal, it was amazing. He's comatose like almost all the time when he takes his blood pressure, except for these spikes. Like one time it went up to, his systolic pressure went up to 171 another time it went up to 165 and since it was so low the rest of the time I said dad what happened on this day oh he goes that day oh, and then he tells me about he's ticked off about something that happened in the whole nine yards so those are outlier readings and seeing that those were two readings out of five a day for a month that he actually kept the journal tells us that he really doesn't need to be medicated and certainly shouldn't be medicated based on his blood pressure reading in the office. So we do have a great doc here. If you watch the Tuesday video clips, you know, we, I talked about why we can't refer to doctors because we, um, we just can't do that. We can prepare you to interact with a doctor. We do have a good doctor here who's pretty good about taking people off of meds they don't need and she was wonderful about getting my father off of uh, blood pressure medication and a bunch of other stuff he was taking that he didn't need either. So prime example of how this can be used productively um, if it's done right. And by the way, we were lucky to have a doctor who's pretty open to this and knew me, but have we walked into a different doctor with that journal? one who wasn't on board with what we do and didn't know me or my family or whatever, I think that any responsible doctor would have looked at my dad's blood pressure readings at like 110 over 70 every day and said, eh, I don't think your dad needs medication, right? So that goes to what I was talking about on Tuesday about being much more um, going about this in the right way where you get a lot more cooperation instead of me just standing in the doctor's office with my dad saying, I don't think my dad needs medication. The doctor says, I think he does. And then, well, we're at a stalemate there, right? Can't get there from here. All right, so next topic under the cardiovascular uh, issue. According to a review published in 2003, this information has been around for a long time, the stuff I talk about. In fact, I've had a thought that I should start a journal called the Journal of Forgotten Research. We'll gather up all the stuff that people need to know about, and we'll put it in one place. Well, oh my gosh, I did that. It's called the Health Briefs Library and Video Clips, right? All right, so according to a review published in 2003, coronary artery bypass surgery relieves symptoms, but it doesn't prevent heart attack, and only very high-risk patients have a better chance of survival as a result of having the procedure. This very same study showed that balloon angioplasty with or without stents improves symptoms, but also doesn't reduce the risk of myocardial infarction or death. Balloon angioplasty does have another interesting effect, however, which is increasing the need for coronary bypass surgery later on. Other studies have shown similar results, and I've cited them here in this article. While not providing much benefit for most patients, there are significant risks associated with coronary by artery bypass surgery, one of which is brain damage, sometimes referred to as pump head. This results in cognitive dysfunction, changes in behavior, impaired decision making, and sometimes symptoms that mimic stroke. The reason is that during the procedure, the patient's heart has to be stopped in order to stitch in the new arteries that bypass those that are blocked. While this is taking place, a cardiopulmonary bypass machine takes over the function of the heart and lungs in order to keep the patient alive and breathing. The damage results from emboli consisting of clots and plaque and fat or gas entering the cerebral circulation from the bypass machine. When this debris enters the small blood vessels, it stops the flow of blood to the tissue causing injury and sometimes tissue death. While most tissues can regenerate after surgery, the brain is not an area that regenerates well and that's what results in cognitive decline. Follow-up studies show that this cognitive decline is prevalent and persists in as many as 42% of patients even five years after they have the procedure. In an attempt to reduce cognitive impairment, surgeons have tried off-pump bypass surgery, but the results have essentially been the same. Yet another complication of coronary artery bypass surgery is myocardial infarction, the very event it's designed to prevent. According to the American Heart Association, about 12,000 people die every year as a result of the procedure, during the procedure. It's difficult to reconcile what I've just been telling you about with the continued enthusiasm for bypass surgery and angioplasty. In 2016, 2.73 million coronary artery bypass surgeries and 4 million angioplasties were performed worldwide and it is expected that this number will increase by about 3.7% per year between now and 2022, with the largest increases in angioplasty. Now, the legitimate question to ask is, is there anybody who benefits from any of this? 
Well, people who have unrelenting and incapacitating chest pain may benefit from angioplasty. Studies show that while it does not reduce the risk of death or MI, it definitely does improve chest pain and the ability to exercise. However, a better alternative is dietary change, which has been shown to reduce episodes of angina by 90% in only three weeks. That's pretty good, I would say. Coronary bypass surgery is warranted as an emergency procedure in response to a heart attack, but in non-emergency cases, the better option is dietary change, which has been shown to stop and even reverse coronary artery disease and to prevent future heart attack and stroke, which bypass does not. So both bypass and angioplasty should be limited to the small percentage of patients who actually benefit and all patients, including those patients, even those patients should be changing their diet and lifestyle habits. So once again, we see this huge disconnect between the way that practice operates, the recommendations that are made, and what the evidence shows the recommendations should be. And so I started my Tuesday video clip talking about doctors. We can't change the way doctors practice right now. What we can change is the information and the training that consumers have before they go into the doctor's office. And so if you have this type of information, you it, it's not that you don't worry about what kind of doctor you have, it's that you're less likely to be hurt by whatever kind of doctor you have. And if you can't find a more cooperative doctor, you can negotiate with the one that you do have. So anyway, that's all for today and actually all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it and I will be back to you next week with more news.